Hi, welcome back to the All Things Homeopathy Materia Medica series. I'm Dr. Larry Malerba, and today I'll be discussing the homeopathic remedy sulfur. Sulfur is a non-metallic, yellow-colored, crystalline substance. It's a mineral on the periodic table with atomic number 16. When combined with hydrogen to make hydrogen sulfide, it gives off that notorious rotten egg smell. Sulfur is arguably the most well-known homeopathic remedy of all. Much can be said about this remedy, but I'm going to try to boil it down to its basic features. So let's get started. All right, let's begin with the fact that sulfur is the most frequently listed remedy in a homeopathic repertories. I checked my own homeopathic computer program and found that sulf is listed in more than 30,000 rubrics, thus representing 30,000 different symptoms. Then I compared that to the numbers for some other very common remedies. Calc carb, for example, is listed in 22,000 rubrics, lycopodium in 23,000 rubrics, and belladonna in 21,000 rubrics. Thus, sulfur is listed in the repertory nearly 50% more times than any other remedy. It's important to know this because it explains why sulf almost always comes up near the top when we repertorize a group of symptoms. So don't be fooled by this. We don't want to be prescribing sulfur for every person who seeks homeopathic treatment. And this highlights the difference between prescribing based upon a purely mechanical repertorization and remedy choices made based on our knowledge of Materia Medica combined with assistance from the repertory. So while sulfur is frequently indicated, it most definitely is not always indicated. Now in trying to distill the sulfur mentals down to their most fundamental features, I came up with the following. Sulfur is characterized by its overconfidence, rationality, indolence, and indifference. Allow me to explain. The typical sulfur type tends to fall somewhere on a spectrum between cocky and extreme overconfidence. While some are merely confident, which is a perfectly wonderful trait to possess, quite a few are more than just confident. They tend to exhibit a kind of self-satisfied overconfidence. Many can be presumptuous, haughty, and even downright arrogant. Most sulfur types are extroverted and outgoing and won't hesitate to strike up a conversation. They have strong personalities and can be quite forward. Some can talk in a loud voice, unaware of how they may sound to others. For some, the sulfur overconfidence is more accurately described as egotism. Many come across as egotistical know-it-alls. Sulf thinks that he is always in the right. He believes himself to be smarter and more knowledgeable than those around him. But he tends to be smart in a rather specific and limited kind of way. He's often factually correct about certain details, and as a consequence, He's prone to citing statistics and quotes from various sources, studies, and articles that he's read. And sulfur can be intimidating in this sense. But while he may know a little bit about a lot of things, in reality, he tends to lack depth of understanding. So while his encyclopedic knowledge may be impressive to some, he tends to lack a solid foundation for the many assertions that he makes. I admit to sometimes feeling amused when a patient consulting me for the first time launches into a discourse designed to demonstrate to me his knowledge of medicine. For example, he may give me a scientific tutorial on his particular medical diagnosis. When it becomes clear that he's memorized some of the scientific facts regarding his condition, but that he lacks a true understanding of the problem or of how homeopathy would approach this problem, I begin to wonder about remedies like sulfur or lycopodium. The difference being that while lycopodium does this in order to compensate for an underlying lack of confidence in himself, sulfur actually believes that he's conveying valuable information, information to me that I need to know. 
a good word for this is pedantic. Someone who is pedantic makes a display of his knowledge of obscure facts and details, often in an annoying or tiresome way. I've coined another term for this sulfur tendency, which I've borrowed from the word mansplaining. Sulfur has a distinct tendency to self-splain. To make matters worse, self may become impatient and irritable toward those who grow tired of his self-splaining and who fail to appreciate that they should be grateful for his willingness to impart his knowledge to them. In fact, one of Sulphur's pet peeves is stupidity. Anyone who is unable to see things his way is, by definition, stupid. I've had more than a few Sulphur patients emphasize to me their intolerance for stupid people. Another prominent feature of sulfur is his highly rational nature. Most sulfur types tend to be left brain dominant. They're logical and analytical. They're more quantitative in perspective than qualitative. The classic caricature of this, of course, is Mr. Spock from Star Trek. Like Spock, sulfur types are mentally preoccupied. They operate from the level of mind more than from the heart. They're much more comfortable with thinking than with feeling. Sulfur is inquisitive, rational, and intellectual. His arrogance comes from the belief that his logical mind gives him a superior way of perceiving the world and its problems. As a consequence, he seeks to master the facts and details that he believes will provide the key to understanding. This unique combination of rationality and overconfidence tends to make Sulphur rather argumentative. He seeks to engage others in debate. He enjoys mental jousting as if it were a sport for enjoyment. To his credit, he's adept at debating without becoming emotionally involved. Of course, sometimes his cockiness can get the better of him and he may become irritated at the stupidity of his intellectual opponent. Sulfur types can also be quarrelsome and critical. However, winning an argument is not always the same thing as uncovering the truth. Sometimes logical su superiority simply points to the eggheadedness of one's perspective. Egghead is a term that implies mental strength, but in a very narrow way in a way that makes one oblivious of other common sense considerations. And this brings me to the fact that the homeopathic books tend to refer to the sulfur type as the ragged philosopher. Sulfur is the most prominently listed remedy in repertories under theorizing and ability for philosophy. Sulphur is the brainy intellectual who has his head in the clouds, oblivious of the fact that he hasn't done the dishes in days or put out the garbage in weeks. His mind is preoccupied with what he believes to be more important things. Those things tend to take the form of data, facts, and all manner of minutia. Another analogy is that of the absent-minded professor. Sulfur is busy theorizing about some scientific or social problem, while the more practical aspects of his life go neglected. Sulfur may be smart and may ask many questions, but he's not necessarily practical, grounded, or well-rounded. He can juggle a mountain of facts in his busy mind, but tends to lack the ability to make a coherent, sensible synthesis out of the whole. Again, these remedy profiles are not always so black and white. Some sulfur types, believe it or not, can be quite practical and down to earth. Okay, now two additional prominent characteristics of sulfur are indolence and indifference. Indolence is another word for lazy, and indifference is another word for apathy. Laziness and apathy are somewhat similar and can have overlapping meanings. Sulfur tends to embody aspects of both. 
He's notoriously lazy, especially when it comes to the things that he views as unimportant. He's usually not lazy about his intellectual pursuits, mind you, just everything else. Slovenly is another word that aptly describes sulfur. Slovenly refers to a person who is lazily careless about neatness and cleanliness, especially when it comes to physical appearances. This brings us back to the image of the absent-minded professor, who is mentally preoccupied but utterly disinterested in taking care of his physical environment. To make matters worse, Sulphur is a notorious collector of things. He collects all kinds of things that he believes may come in handy someday in the future. He saves old magazines and collects odds and ends from garage sales. Oftentimes, his most prized possession is his book collection. As time passes, his living space becomes increasingly cluttered with items that never get organized or properly put away. I've had quite a few sulfur types reassure me that even though they may appear to outsiders to be disorganized and chaotic, there's a method to their madness. Amusingly, they insist that they have their own system that allows them to know where, amidst the apparent chaos, to find what they need. So the sulfur stereotype is that of a sloppy, messy, unkempt person who is too lazy to organize his personal belongings. He may even be indifferent to his personal hygiene and may go so far as to neglect bathing. The homeopathic literature refers to this as an aversion to bathing. He's indifferent because he really doesn't care about such trivial matters, only that which is important to him. In this sense, sulfur can be selfish. He selfishly tends to his own interests and ignores the things that may be important to his family, friends, and loved ones. When confronted with his bad habits, he may pledge to do better, but then fails to make good on his word. Sulfur is known for its tendency to procrastinate. He tends to clean up his he intends to clean up his mess or to clean up his act, but he never quite manages to do so. He always puts it off for another day. Now don't get me wrong, this is a sulfur stereotype. Sometimes it's true, sometimes not. In truth, these characteristics can manifest on a spectrum from very mild or even non-existent all the way up to the obvious and dramatic. And yes, it's true, some sulfur types can actually be fastidious. On the other hand, sometimes the sulfur indolence and indifference can grow so strong as to take the form of a depression. In such cases, it can look like the apathetic depression of a sepia or phosphoric acid. The good news is that homeopaths never grow tired of hearing follow-up reports from patients who have rec recently taken sulfur. Not infrequently, they will note a surge in motivation that allowed them to clean up a room or organize a project that they had been intending to get to, but just hadn't found the time or energy to begin. Okay, now let's close out the mentals with the sulfur fears. I find most sulfur types to have relatively few fears. So for our purposes here, the only fear worth mentioning is the sulfur fear of heights. He may fear heights and may get vertigo when in high places. There can be other fears, but generally speaking, sulfur is not a very fear-based remedy. If anything, sulfur is more confident than fearful. Now, before we go any further, I want to clarify that sulfur is a remedy that can fit both men and women. I've referred to sulfur here as he, mainly for the sake of convenience. Okay, now let's talk about the sulfur generals, modalities, and physical symptoms. Just like I summarized the mentals under four broad categories, I'm, I'm going to try to do the same here for the physical symptoms. Therefore, generally speaking, many sulfur physical symptoms tend to fall under the following four headings. Itching, burning, heat, and redness. 
First off, sulfur is notorious for its many itchy skin conditions. Sulfur can have rashes and eruptions of all kinds. It's one of the itchiest of all remedies. And wherever there's itching, there also tends to be redness and burning. Sulfur is so itchy that when I see a skin problem that is not accompanied by itching, I hesitate to prescribe sulfur. On the other hand, any itchy condition that is also red and or burning must make us think of sulfur. The sulfur itch is usually aggravated by warmth, worse from bathing, worse at night, aggravated by the heat of the bed, worse from wearing wool, and better from cold. Now, sulfur is also notoriously warm-blooded. It's one of the warmest of all remedies. Sulfur also perspires easily. He frequently sleeps with his bare feet sticking out from under the covers. Some do this because their feet are hot. Some do it because their feet burn. Some sulfur types sleep without covers at all, even during the winter. When you see the sloppily dressed guy walking around in his shorts in the winter, think sulfur. In addition to heat, there may also be burning. There can be burning sensations and or burning pains. Oftentimes the feet can burn and sometimes the vertex or top of the head can burn. Whenever we see burning pains anywhere, the three main remedies to consider are sulfur, phosphorus, and arsenicum. Many sulfur conditions also tend to be accompanied by redness. We frequently see redness of the skin and also redness of the orifices. There may be redness of the lips, ears, nose, and anus, and there may also be redness of the parts affected by a particular condition. So when dealing with conditions like conjunctivitis, vaginitis, urethritis, blepharitis, rhinitis, or otitis, we think of sulfur when the associated parts are red, itchy, and burning. Generally speaking, in terms of food preferences, sulfur is famous for its craving for hot, spicy foods. These are the people who can tolerate foods too spicy for the average person to handle. When a patient says he prefers mildly spicy food, I hesitate to prescribe sulfur. Sulfur also desires sweet things. When we see a desire for hot, spicy, and sweets, we think sulfur. Sulf also like sour foods, but usually to a lesser extent. And they like rich foods and alcoholic beverages. Sulf usually prefers ice cold drinks. Many sulfur types will say that they love food or that they like all kinds of foods. On the other hand, the one consistent sulfur aversion tends to be eggs. Many do not like eggs. Now let's discuss the sulfur modalities. As we've seen, sulfur is aggravated by heat, especially by the heat of the bed or by a warm bath. And he's aggravated by bathing in general. Sulfur is aggravated by standing and from stooping. This applies especially to his back pains or back problems. Sulfur conditions are often worse on the left side and he's prone to developing left-sided symptoms. One common left-sided sulfur symptom is left shoulder pain. Sulfur can be made worse from suppressed skin eruptions. This makes sense given sulfur's strong tendency to, to develop skin conditions. Any topical or oral drug designed to suppress an itch or rash can lead to a worsening of sulfur's overall health. In terms of time modalities, sulfur symptoms are worse at 11 a.m. Some like to skip breakfast, but then become hungry around 11 a.m. Sulfur also has a tendency to, tendency to wake early, especially around 4 or 5 a.m. 
some sulfur conditions are also aggravated early in the morning, especially his digestive symptoms. Now, speaking of digestive symptoms, sulfur has a tendency to develop diarrhea. The diarrhea is usually worse in the early morning, especially around 5 or 6 a.m. It may force him to jump up from bed in order to get to the bathroom. When there's diarrhea in the morning accompanied by burning or even itching, we think of sulfur. Additional sulfur digestive conditions that involve burning include gastritis and heartburn. Now, sulfur is such a commonly indicated polycrest that it may be useful in virtually any type of illness. If we see general characteristics like warm-bloodedness, sloppiness, and desire for spicy hot foods, then sulfur may be the needed remedy. Now, in terms of remedy relationships, sulfur is one of three remedies in the commonly indicated sequence of calcarea, lycopodium, and sulfur. Both aconite and bryonia are commonly indicated remedies for acute ailments contracted by sulfur types. Remedies to compare to sulfur include pulsatilla and metarinum, both of which are quite warm-blooded, graphitis, which has a lot of skin symptoms, natrum, sulfuricum, and aloe, both of which get diarrhea attacks in the morning, and serinum, which is both a complement to sulfur and can be easily mistaken for sulfur. Both remedies tend to be apathetic, slovenly, and itchy. The main difference is that while sulf is warm-blooded, serinum tends to be very chilly. Okay, let's finish with a quick review of some sulfur keynotes. We have warm bloodedness and aggravation from heat, desire for hot spicy foods and sweets, aversion to eggs, cockiness and argumentativeness, sloppiness, apathy and procrastination, left-sided symptoms, itchy skin conditions, and burning pains and sensations. Okay, that's all for sulfur. Thank you for supporting my efforts to bring you quality homeopathic information. The best way to do that is to subscribe and to tell others about the All Things Homeopathy channel. And until next time, may the vital force be with you.